Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Nash County Board of Education Committee members meeting. We have we have uh, quite a few items on the agenda tonight, so we will get started and expeditiously do what we need to do to take care of them. Thank you. So the first item on the agenda um, it will be the uh, Administrative Service Operations Committee meeting. We're going to take a roll call for that. Make sure we have a quorum. Bill Sharp's here. Mike, are you online? He did call and say he would be online. Doug Tavis? He's not online. Frank Lamb? Toronto Bull? Here. You online? I'm here. Okay, so that's three out of five. Hear you, but uh, she, she just muted me. Can you raise your hand if you can second the motion? Say something. Ronda, can you hear me? Oh, I'm sorry, I can hear you now. I couldn't hear anything. You know, I mean, Doctor, just keep me on the table. Oh my word! Okay. All right, great. Shirley, can you second the motion, please? Second. Okay, so probably moved and second. All those things say aye. 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 First aye. item on our agenda is Shannon Davis for information on regarding Red Oak Elementary School. Okay, good afternoon. Just want to give an update on uh, Red Oak Elementary School and where progress is and things that are going on with construction. You will go ahead and start the slide. This is way back. This is kind of the layout of the, the plan of the school and what it should look like from a site from a site view. This again is just a floor plan. I'm gonna start pictures right after this, but this kind of gives you the layout. The wing going straight out the back is second, third graders. Uh, the ring to the wing to the right is the K2. The wing going back toward the gym to the left is uh, fourth, fifth grade with the admin and the purple up front. Uh, media center in the middle and the cafeteria dining to be the front right. Again, this is just a front rendering. Uh, the entrance, you got the vestibule coming in where you check folks in on the far left and then the main entrance uh, straight ahead. This is the existing school pictures taken last week of the previous picture I just showed you. That's the vestibule to the left and we've got the front entrance and uh, another, another set of exit doors to the right that walks you straight into their office. This here is another rendering uh, when we first designed the school. Uh, media center is what you're seeing there with all the glass facade up front. This is taken last Tuesday, kind of gives you a look of the exact building and how, how it's looking. This is inside the media center. Uh, there's still a lot of construction going on. Uh, that's just the main area further back. They're still hanging sheetrock. You see a lot of the mechanical stuff going in. Uh, still quite a, bit of, quite a bit of work to do there. This is the dining room. Looking into the big open area you see is back, looking back into the kitchen, the serving line kind of comes through. The very open door right, kids come in to come through the serving line, come back out to the dining room. This is a rendering of out front. Uh, far right down there is the buses. That's the bus uh, shelter down at the far end. And this end is the car line pickup. 
And again, next slide, this is the far end. That's the buses will come down at the far end of that. They will not fall in the car line. They go straight out beside the existing elementary school and exit. What we're looking down right now is the actual car line itself, uh, the future car line as it zigzags. This is the last run where they, where they pick the kids up. Sure. That's the church. Yes, that's the back. No, that'll be fenced off. We got a road. That's where the buses come down and run straight. That's curb and gutter. They won't have access on. You you can't see the road, but it's, it's about a 20 foot wide. Buses will come in off Red Oak Battleboro Road and cut down through and drop off and go straight out by the new, right down beside the, the Methodist Church in the existing school back out to Red Oak Road. The, the, the cars and the, uh, the buses will not uh, they want to be able to overlap. We should have, I want to say the issue, but I'll say as much of an issue with the um, car line as we do now. We, we, we hope not. We, we have, and I hate to say battle with DOT, but we've got 3,600 linear feet of stacking lane for this school. They were recommending around 1,800 to 22. So we've got almost twice what they've recommended. Uh, you know, it's a moving target. It seems like every year we've had schools, we go in and try to lengthen and then more kids opt to, to be carried to school. And it just is constantly creating issues for us. You know, at, at some point we run out of property to stack them on our property. So we may uh, still have the issues that we have now. We well, the, believe it or not, the elementary school is probably one of the few schools we do not have a stacking problem right now. Now, granted, we've got 200 kids, but we've only got single lane. We are double stacking some right there, but right now, Red Oak Elementary is probably one of the few schools we don't have an issue. But now we're throwing, you know, 500 more kids on us. So uh, we, we we've planned as much as we can plan, and we've stacked about as much as we can stack uh, without getting in DOT right away. It's, basically what we've done. So the um, adjusted stacking lane with double the Yes. And, and, and DOT, we've kind of worked out a compromise. We've added ours. They've got theirs. There's some things that if we end up with issues, uh, that they're going to help us address if we do. So. Yeah. This is the, the main corridor. If you'll look here in the next pictures, looking straight out in the yellow is the second, third grade wing. If you go back, if you go to the left, you're going back toward the gym for the fifth grade. And if you go to the right, you see the upper, that's the K2 wing. This is where they all converge. Um, and then you head back toward the front of the school. Uh, if you're standing looking at the, the yellow wing, your back goes back to the, the front office, if that makes sense. So you gotta go. There, there's colors in the bed. They're not those exact colors because that was a rendering. Right. We have, uh, I think, blue, orange, and uh, yellow, I think. Are the... <laughs> this is the one of the bathrooms sitting right off that court. It's the boys' bathroom. You can see all the tiles in. I mean, that that's basically finished, but suspended ceilings uh, and setting fixtures. This is the girls' restroom. So all of the... The ceramic tile pretty much on, on campus, all the bathrooms in the K2 is pretty much, pretty much completed and installed floors and walls. All right, go back to the next one. Okay, this is looking down. This was the yellow wing I was telling. This is the, the pre-K to kindergarten looking back toward the Baptist Church. So the, the, the EC and the buses, if you look at the end of that down there, that's the road the buses will come down and, and offload on the front of the campus. This is looking back toward Red Oak Middle School football field. This is second, third grade wing. And this is headed toward the gymnasium. Uh, that's fourth, fifth grade. And of course, this is the gym. They're, they're out working now on the canopies. You'll see those doors, they're old doors. They, they all of that will be replaced. Uh, canopy poles will be painted. Uh, next slide. This is the gym. This was last week. Uh, they did finish putting uh, the bleachers together. They rolled out last Friday. They're sanding the floor today, moved in to start sanding and refinishing the gym floor. You can see they got the new windows inside the gym, and that's the new paint scheme, uh, the new colors, the stripes on the walls. 
They put their automatic. They're like every other campus. Yep, all of the, that's this is the last elementary for bleacher renovation. The whole the entire district have uh, gyms have new bleachers. This slide here I caught toward the tail end. We they're window frames. We've been waiting for those for three months. I figured I'd put this slide in there. It's it's been an interesting an interesting venture. Uh, but they are putting they're going into three hundred wing. We're still having a few issues there, but. Uh, at least they're on site now installing, so we start drying the building. No, just the 300. They, they worked the back side of the 300 last week to work in the west side. This week will be complete, and then they'll march on through the front of the building. The windows are, are not going to be the issue now. Um, we, we do have some challenges. I'll speak to those now. I think that was the last. That's the last slide. So I want to talk just about a, a couple challenges we still do have. Uh, terrazzo flooring is now our next issue. Uh, I was told, you know, three weeks ago it would be three weeks. Now we're still two to three weeks. The terrazzo material has not arrived. Uh, you, you know, we're, we're not in a panic mode yet. It'll go down quick. The guys that are installing the terrazzo have a, have a big group. It's not like we're dealing with a small company. Once they come in, They'll be able to go pretty quick. There's very little terrazzo in the classrooms. Most of it's going to be hallway, dining room. So we just got the wet areas in the classrooms going to be terrazzo. The problem is, is now your, your, your casework sits on the terrazzo. So now your casework guy can't get into the terrazzo guy. Gets in casework's built, it's ready. Uh, the other challenge is, sure. They sub that through, uh, I'm not sure who they're using. I think it's an outfit out of Raleigh, uh, but it's subbed through the general contractor. No, there's nobody local. No, sir. Um, permanent power. You know, we're, we're hopefully going to get it second week of October is what we're being told right now. But now we're dealing with a storm. Duke Energy, uh, you know, they do the Carolinas, North Carolina, South Carolina. Now they do Florida. So if we end up with a with a with a big mess, and all the install groups will probably be sent to Florida. So that could become an issue. Now we're on temporary power now, but at some point we got to get permanent power in that building so we can start conditioning the space. Uh, on a bright note, all the furniture's been ordered. It's ready. I've actually got vendors wanting to install, but we're trying to push them back. Um, I'm trying to get the gym ready. Uh, so we can tarp it. We'll start receiving furniture that we're going to install in-house. Uh, media center, admin, all that stuff sitting off site, uh, ready to be installed. So cafeteria equipment, uh, dining room furniture, all of that stuff is, is ready to go in. Um, we do have a contingency plan if things uh, do go a little bit sideways. The, the, the GC is still confident. We're going to make the December deadline to get the kids in. You know, goal, our goal is to get teachers in there before Christmas, before they go home, set classrooms up. That's our, our, our goal. Um, we met with fire marshals last week to make a plan. If we have to isolate an area, uh, it would be the K-2 kids from the existing school is really all we need in the building now. The, the two, three, four, five are the kids coming over from Swift Creek Cedar Grove. So we really don't need the entire campus to open in January. Uh, we're going to concentrate on the K2 wing, the admin, media center, and dining rooms. So once we get that, I mean, really from a realistic standpoint, we really don't need the rest of the building if it comes to that. That's what we're concentrating on trying to get ready now. And the remainder of the, the two, three, four, five, he's saying maybe mid late January. So we're really only talking three to four weeks to bring the, the entire site online. So with that, are there any questions for me? We're looking at um, transitioning the ROE school in January. Teacher staff going in prior to start school. Have you got a timeline when you want those teachers to have their classroom set up and start? You're talking about the teachers who are in this? And, yes, sir. The offer, John Wait, Mr. Davis. Call. We've got two dates, probably before Christmas or during the middle of Christmas. I thought we got to make sure. We got a plan. But really depends on 
It's still going to be closed in on that part. It, it, it's fluid. It, we're hoping to be able to get uh, what they call a stocking CO, where we can get furniture in. And if we've got uh, teachers who have things boxed up, we're hoping to get the stuff in the building. So that all they'll have to do is set up. So that we're hoping to uh, to make it as easy upon them as, as we can. Ms. Williams has already had the conversation about what we're going to do. Does that help? Yep. They, they, they know what's happening. And she has two or three plans based on when we can get in. We have, we met them with next, we got our next construction meeting. I think it's 23rd of October, 24th. We've invited them back out. They want to do uh, monthly walkthroughs to make sure we're where we say we're going to be, but we've got a plan on how we can cordon those off. As long as all the life safety is in place, uh, it wouldn't be the issues. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. So, I'm on fire, sir. Sure. <laughs> so, the next item on the agenda, that's no presentation only. The next item on the agenda is probably the Academy Surplus Center. Yeah. Okay, the Old Tall River Academy, formerly known as Braswell Elementary School, has been closed now for almost two years. Tall River Academy was relocated to Rocky Mount Middle School campus. The campus is currently sitting vacant. The campus was constructed in 1940. And the last FCI conducted in 2013 was a 1.85. And any number over one is recommended. Uh, major renovation ought to be closed. There's no fiscal implications involved at this time. The recommendation is the superintendent recommends the board surplus the property and Nash Nash County Board of Commissioners to write a first refusal as per general statutes. The superintendent also recommends the board to direct staff to place for sale signs and solicit an offer to stop the upset bid process if that is the process the board so chooses. Yes. We also have Lake. Lake's on board? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I heard it. So, uh, did you hear that, Lake? Yes. Lake? Lake, are you there? Okay, I'd like to make a motion to put the car a little bit in. Bill, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Lamb. Can I get a second? Second. Second. Property moved by Mr. Lamb, second by Ms. S. Bullock. Any other questions or discussions? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any, any opposition? Just for me. Now, before you leave, I also want to find out basically you talk next step is going through the county. Yes, we need to offer it to Nash County for right of first refusal. Okay. And and they would either have to purchase it at fair market value right. or refuse it. Then the board. The, the full board, I assume, would have to vote on the process of whether or not to use the upset bid process, which is what we have normally gone by. Whatever you guys vote on is how we. So we, we will have that discussion in this committee meeting. Right, right, okay. Right. So that's like Sharon, Mr. Lamb, we need to, or Dr. Shea is not on, right? We need to have that discussion. Um, Frankly, do you have? I can't see changing what we've done in the past and make it fair. So the same way we did Spalding, same way we did the ball field, we need to continue on the same process, in my opinion. So, is that a recommendation or any other is that a recommendation, Mr. Lake? So, I should say, is that a motion? Well, I'll wait for everybody else to. I will do that in the discussion when we have I'll make a motion that we use the upset view process. Can I get a second? Second. Oh, it's second. It's been probably moving a second. Any further questions or discussions? Question Can we add that you recommend it to the full board? Yes. 
That's what absolutely. So the motion is we recommend this process to the full board. And then we'll have we'll have that. So um any other questions or discussion? Thank you, Ms. Moore. No, I don't have no, sir. I am in favor of that. Um that process as well. Okay. So you know, no other questions or discussions. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, opposition. No opposition. I just got it. So you. there's one other thing that we want to have a discussion on. Uh, we looked at what we have the the to bring to the full board as far as the pricing for this unit. So one of the things we had discussion about last time was actually the tax value. Yes, we we can use a tax value, but I think uh, Mr. Malone, the first time we, we solicited an offer for sale signs, see what kind of solicitation we get, see what kind of an offer we get, and then we can kind of, the board can decide, do they want to start at the offer price or do we want to start at a higher price? Now, I did, I was able to find uh, the tax value for the property is actually sitting on 2.73 acres it's got a land value of thirty nine thousand thirty dollars and the total taxable value is 1.305 million <laughs> so that's the tax value for the property and let me um that, that's great well let me tell you why we're having this discussion because basically um um regarding and it's not on this, but we got a uh, need for capital money for the Nash, Northern Nash Field House, somewhere in the neighborhood of $1.5 million based upon what we've had. I think the grant we was received was what? I think the county commission so, said they would have about $3 million to spend on the field house. I think it's going to call 4.7 or 4.5. So we're going to be under. But now if we start selling these schools, then we will be able to have some sort of a fund that we can push towards in order to And that's the engagement of what we need to try to do. So with that discussion, I'm bringing it to this committee. So basically we have discussion about the needs for that 1.5. We do have, we did sell the property for the baseball diamond at 110. One yes. So we are still short 1.3, 1.4. And so that's why, Tim, I appreciate you bringing us that tax value of 1.3 million. 1.3 million. I don't know if we're getting it, but that's. This, this is starting to get the game. Bill. Hold on. Chair recognize Mr. Lamb. Just like that's a good starting point for me. So that's why that tax value will be the money we need. Sell that tax value, you don't do that. That's what we try, normally we try to do when we work out. Uh, yes, must have like, um, Shannon, on school property or municipal property, is there any kind of adjustment on tax value like there is on farmland? I mean, it, it's not taxed at the same rate as commercial property, is it? I'm sure it's not because, you know, we don't pay taxes to start with. This is just basically pulled directly off the, the Nash County GIS. GIS, yeah. I, yes. I think there's some no, some noise in that number as opposed to maybe what a true value might look at. But I'd certainly be in favor of, you know, let, letting it go through the bid process. Any other questions? Ms. Esbo, any questions, comments? No. Okay, so that was for information only. I think what we would do, I would ask Shannon or Dr. Ellis if we could actually get a more firm number if we can as far as the, uh, what we think the value of that land would be. So at our board meeting, we can sort of maybe have something that's the starting point to expedite this process. Sure. Did, did we get an appraisal on spalding or a, a valuation of spalding? I don't think we ever received a valuation. I think they looked at at, at the, the tax value. Uh, I'm not sure where they started, if it started below tax value, but it, it ultimately went above tax value with Spalding. I'm not sure if Pope went above. I'm pretty sure Pope did not go above uh, tax value. Gotcha. But okay. it's, 
I think the 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 law of states uh, fair market value is kind of where where we have to where we have to abide by. Yeah. I started doing one of those until about two or three years ago. I don't know what I was doing all that time. Oh, uh, um, anything else regarding um, Carver Academy? We also have another property that's coming up for surplus. Is that correct? Yes, sir. At some point, it'll be bringing more than likely W.O. Green. W.O. Green. So what's the status for that? Uh, we've still got some, some items uh, in that building, so we're not quite ready. we got storage, and we've got some other records in one of the houses. So we've still got to relocate some of those items to get it ready to sell. Uh, Tar River, the, the Braswell campus is pretty much emptied out. So it's ready for, for surplus. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Mr. Hale, the 22-23 budget. Good afternoon, Finance Committee. Uh, the Nash County Public Schools Administration is pleased to present to you the 22-23 initial budget resolution, which has been developed from the plan from the initial allotments that we've received from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. This initial budget resolution consists of the following five funds: the state fund, the local fund, capital outlay, child nutrition, and our special grants fund. Fund three, which is our federal grants, the allotments are typically not received until September, October, and therefore are not included in this initial budget resolution. I'm anticipating the federal grants uh, will be added to the budget via the budget amendment process by the November board meeting or, and or the uh, December board meeting. Uh, the budget resolution as presented is segregated by fund. Within each fund section, the budget is summarized by the total expenditures uh, budgeted by purpose codes, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, et cetera, and the corresponding revenue source or sources. As you may note, each fund is balanced in accordance with state statute. The last page of this budget resolution provides guidance on the order in which funding should be expended, intra and interfund transfers, banking designations as official depositories, daily deposits of funds, and the use of facsimile signatures by the finance officer and other designated school officers. Uh, this resolution is the district's beginning budget for this school year and will be amended periodically during the fiscal year as allotment revisions from DPI are received as well as other revenue sources are, are received. Well, with that being said, administration is presenting this budget resolution to the finance committee as an action item for approval. Okay, so this is the next item to present to the full board for approval on our money meeting. I need a motion, please. Make the motion to present to the full board. Second. Second. It's been probably moved by Ms. Nam, seconded by Mr. Dutton. Question or discussion? <clears throat> no, sir. All those in favor, say aye. 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 You know, opposed, eyes headed. Before you sit down, thank you so very much. This is early, isn't it? And so we've got to get this early before. We haven't had a budget pass for the state in four years, maybe. I can't remember now. It's been a little longer, it's four years. Years. so we've been using our budget, but we can keep continuation of the budget. So it might be the first time we've actually had it. Well, they don't. The state finished it a little earlier this year than, than in my prior years past, because I mean, it's it's gone into January. Uh, I can remember that. Um, I did fail to mention to you though, that the um, that currently uh, we've been operating on a continuing resolution that the board approved. So um, so this will be, be our beginning, um, beginning budget for this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, I have on agenda information on Dr. Elliott. Thank you. Click on that one for me. Yeah. Uh, briefly, I'm just going to describe to the board when we had the CNA conversation last board meeting, they talked about evaluation, and I wanted to make sure I kind of piece it together to show the board what we're doing with evaluations for principals this year. 
because also it kind of hooks on mine. So I want to kind of bring both of them together. So what you're going to see is in August on this first chart, you're going to see that principal sign up for a PDP conversation with, with their evaluator. Um, Wayne, could you go to all the way to the evaluation at the bottom? Of the there you go. All right, so what you're going to see, this is probably start off the easier. You're going to see that each administrator is going to have a lead evaluator, a lead evaluator, which would be senior staff. That would be me, Dr. Farrow, and Ms. Nancy Smith. We would be the lead evaluators this year for principals. Also, principals have coaches based on where they're at, their years of service, whether they're in a low-performing school. DPI has assisted us with one of those coaches, whereas we had other coaches come through other ways where we contract out that work. So what you're going to see is a lead evaluator. You're going to see a principal coach. And then when our schools have school improvement plans, you're going to see other coaches involved in their school improvement plan. So I wanted to kind of show you the layers of how we do this this year. Um, now, in September, principals are turning in their PDPs, which means they meet with us with goals. I'll go over goals shortly. Then what we do is September, October, we have started looking at school improvement plans where they present their school improvement plans to their coach and senior staff and cabinet. Then uh, around January, they have a mid-year evaluation. And then in June, they'll have their end of year evaluation. When it comes to goals, Personal evaluation expectations. I want to share this one because when you when you see my goals for the district at the next board meeting, here's what it's going to kind of sort of look like. What we did was we started putting measurable goals for principals to obtain. So what you're going to see is uh, an example would be under instructional leadership dropout data. If you're a high school principal, you would want to decrease that number. EOCs and EOG proficiency, they need to go up certain amounts. Positive growth, school letter grades. We've got all sorts of data points in here that I want you to see. At the bottom, when you're looking at managerial leadership, we talk about discipline data in subgroups. So what they will be focusing on is referrals, suspensions amongst all subgroups. But I wanted you to see kind of what their template looks like. They basically will pick two of our indicators for our strategic plan and put it in their PDP goals and also their school improvement plan. So my evaluation is going to look like theirs. So we're kind of all on the same page, if that makes sense. So what we did was they know that these are the certain goals that we're looking for. And we're going to monitor those on a monthly basis. An example would be at a principal meeting, we would go over benchmark data. We would go over attendance, discipline. So they'll see their data in real time so we can track it. And just like I shared my artifacts with the board, each principal has their own artifact list that shares with senior staff so they can continue to dump artifacts so they can prove how well they're doing. Okay. So I just wanted to kind of show you the link because there is a lot of stuff up there, but at your time, kind of look. But when you see my, um, kind of like our measured goals, and I met with Mr. Sharp and Dr. Washington about that, you'll see how it kind of all fits. Because what I want the principals to understand is their goals are going to look like my goals. So we'll all be on the same page. All right. Any questions on that? And, and I'll have some more when I share with the board uh, my goals. So then you'll kind of, it kind of fits together. All right, and that's just for information. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. If there's no questions regarding Dr. Ellis's, the Administrative Service Committee, I will adjourn that meeting. We'll move in next to the um, Student Service Support Group. Okay, so there's no call for the next few. Um, we'll give them a little bit. Yeah. So, um, academic services. Ron, are you ready for that?
Um, if you would like to head that up, that would be great. I'm just getting back, so it, it's up to you. Hello? I don't know who's on your committee. Lance, who's on that committee? Um, Siobhan Thomas Bullock, Frank M. Lamb, Dr. Washington, Zach Gray, and Chris Pitt. Do we have enough for that group? So let's just start with that session, academic services. Um, the first item on the agenda is, well, I need a motion to accept the, um, the agenda. So moved. Second. Okay. It's been probably moved by that's an abstract by Dr. Washington. Um, all those in favor say aye. Any opposed? First sign of Melissa Nancy. Okay, Melissa Nancy. Okay, Melissa Nancy. Good evening. Good. Good evening, Chairman Lamb and other members of the Academic Services and Accountability Committee. Last month, I stood before you requesting research for the EZWAR. At that time, it was um, recommended that additional evidences um, were submitted in order to approve the research. And those evidences were surveys for teachers and students, and they've since been submitted, parental um, permission slips, as well as the IRB, and all four have been resubmitted. Just to recap the purpose of the research, E. 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 Zwar is an undergraduate student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel, Chapel Hill and is requesting to participate in research that involves surveying middle and high school students and teachers about their beliefs regarding intelligence. The survey will take approximately 10 to 15 minutes to complete and can be completed in person or online. In addition to that, um, participants may also complete a 10-minute optional online interview. In exploring the relationship between socioeconomic status and beliefs of intelligence, the researcher believes that it is important to understand students' mindset and thus elevating their academic performance. If the research proven, is proven to be um, beneficial to our district, we hope to use the study re, um, results to guide possible professional development programs to improve students and teachers' beliefs, teacher efficacy, student efficacy, and student confidence and motivation. There are no financial implications involved. The strategic priorities are priority five, transparent organizational culture effective use of resources, priority six, engaged and connected community, and the superintendent submits this item for approval. If I would be review of the supplemental or documents that were provided, I would like to recommend that we recommend approval of this research on um, 32 approval. Let's get a second. Second. It's been properly moved by Dr. Washington, seconded by Mr. Mayor. Questions or discussions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye, please. Aye. Any opposition? Aye, as Heather. Uh, Ms. Dancy Smith, thank you so very much for bringing me. Thank you. It's Monique Hargrove Jones. Three class size maximum requirements. This is an action item. Good evening, Academic Services and Accountability Committee, other board members, and Dr. Ellis. In accordance with General Statute 115C301, House Bill 13, local boards of education must comply with the class size maximum outlined for grades K through three. For the last school year, 2021-2022 and beyond, these numbers are for kindergarten, an LEA maximum average of 18, individual class size of 21, 
First grade, average of 16, individual class size of 19. Second grade, average of 17, individual class size of 20. And third grade, average of 17, individual class size of 20. Currently, Nash County Public Schools has K-3 classes that are over the individual maximum and district average. The superintendent is requesting additional teacher positions to comply with this K-3 class size maximum. At the end of the second school month and for the remainder of the school year, the size of an individual class may not exceed the LEA wide ratio by three students, so long as the LEA wide average class size maximums are not exceeded. Fiscal implications for this, we need approximately six additional teacher positions and an average salary of $57,000 for an estimated total of $342,000. This aligns to our strategic priorities, priority one, to increase grade level proficiency across all grades and subjects, priority two, increase the number of schools that exceed growth, and priority three, ensure equitable outcomes for all subgroups. The superintendent recommends approval to allocate additional teacher positions to comply with this state K-3 class size mandate. Are there any questions? We have a motion. I move that recommend the A second. Second. It's been properly moved by Dr. Washington. Second, I think about Shrana. Would it Shrana move? Yes. Okay. Questions or discussions? Question. Six teachers. We need six teachers. Approximately. We yes, have sir. six teachers by a little. So I'm working with Ms. Wallace, and we've been meeting, and we're looking at the district K-12 to see if we may have some schools that are under. And if there are any positions that can be moved into those before we actually advertise and try, because we know recruitment has been an issue. So that would be our first course of action before we would actually post. Question, Ms. Short. Yes, sir. Question. I, I, I think I know the answer, but I just want to confirm. So these six teachers would be state funded, not local funded, correct? Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? My second question, you said every salary is 57, that includes benefits and everything. Yes, sir, it is. That's a good Is there any other questions or discussions? Yes, I have a question. Yes, um, just looking at um, the K-3 specifically, I know that we have some K-2 classes, uh, I'm sorry, K-2 schools. Um, is that something that we can take into consideration changing the structure of the schools that would also possibly help and um, also uh, change the structure for accountability and those purposes? Is that something that we can kind of just look at for um, maybe next year moving into the future? You're talking about going to K-5. Is that Yes, K five or K three, preferably probably K five. I'm not sure what your what the committee would recommend um, or what the superintendent would recommend, but I think a structural change would may be helpful. Um, Ms. Bullock, Sharonda Bullock. Yes. Could you, for the sake of myself as well as anybody else, could you explain to us the structural change? So right now we have certain schools that. Um, are just K-2, and I think that we have a structural change moving to either K-3 or K-5. Um, my personal preference, I think, would be K-5 would be better. Um, I think on a lot of different levels um, that would be helpful in terms of academics um, and other areas of, that may need support, um, especially with accountability. So I think that changing the structure from K-2 to either K-3 or K-5 would be um immensely helpful, especially given the circumstances that we're in, in terms of our school grades and um, the gaps that we're trying to close right now. 
I, I do agree with that. I think a K-5 setup to me would, you know, you're carrying someone else's performance score if you're K-2 and you weren't in the building, did not know one's building. Now you're going to shut one down with, you know, Cedar Grove, Split Creek. So you're going to do something, but um, I really, that is a good thing to look at, see if we could do a K-5 setup for those K-2 schools. Thank you. Follow-up question to that was how many facilities were it impact? I don't think facility-wise, it just depends on how you want to, I think it would be how you push those kids, where would we send them? I don't think you're in buildings. What you're doing is well, populating the kids. Yes, because you have right now for K-2, well, Red Oak Elementary will no longer be K-2, so that one's taken off, but you still have Fairview, you have Winstead, and you have Williford that are still um, K-2 schools. So... When you say Fairview instead and Willowford, yes, they only have K through two. They only have so K through two. Impact with three schools. If you're looking at K through five, if you move from K through five, what would you do with the one half of those kids in those three schools? So yeah, they would have to be redistributed to make it even. <clears throat> um, where they're now pulling um students that would be in their home zone plus other schools for the three five like Inglewood being three five so you have k2 at wave three five at Inglewood you would have to redistribute those so that wave would have their own k5 in that area and Inglewood would then house the k2 that normally that are in Winstead Avenue sorry <laughs> that they would have their own um k5 at Inglewood would be k5 so you're splitting up that population but you're in the same zone of kids yeah. Yes. In the same zone, you're just feeding them into two separate schools. Yes, right. exactly. Yes, they were. They were. Williford used to be close by. Okay, Williford was as well. You're welcome. And I just I think it's really important for the accountability um, and for the continuity and consistency for the students to to do K-5 um, versus K-2. It does make a difference. And we can look at other schools in the district and, and look at kind of the success that they've had and, and do comparison. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Very interesting. Thank you, Ms. Bullock, for that suggestion. Uh, next item on the agenda is Mr. Chad Thomas for PTE COVID as arts and food trail. So good evening. We are excited about the information that I want to present today um, on the CTE culinary food trailer. Uh, if you notice as you ride down the road, you probably cannot ride down without seeing a food truck or food, food trailer somewhere, which is a big part of the culinary world today. Uh, you may or may not know it that uh, many chefs today are preparing gourmet meals in food trailers and uh, food trucks. Um, and so what we want to do, as always, is try to keep our students on the cutting edge. And so what we have done is to invest in a culinary food trailer, uh, which will be outfitted uh, with items to allow our culinary students to cook, prepare, and have a point of sales item for the business side of it so that they can prepare for the next wave of uh, food service in, in the business. So if you don't mind, this is our uh, culinary arts, it's called the Food Factory. Um, and you notice that the factory is behind and ingrained in the food trailer. Um, so on the other side, of course, is the serving window. We want to still have a, a grand opening with this. Um, the inside is not completed yet. It's just the outside. So we're working now. Uh, and hopefully by the end of October, middle or end of October, we will have it fully completed and ready for service where our students can start engaging and uh, selling out of it, uh, preparing meals out of it, uh, and learning that side of the culinary arts business. So uh, I will entertain any questions uh, that you have about it. And so we're excited about it. And I think we can utilize it for many places around in our district 
but also our students are going to have the the best experiences that they can with the most modern culinary um, opportunities. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. Mr. Thompson, this, this is Chris. Yes, sir. I, keep it in the back of your mind when that thing's in service, I'd like to see it set up at a board meeting for dinner one night. Yes, sir. We will make it happen. Thank we'll, you. Have that we'll have that discussion. Bill's buying, Bill's paying, he's got it. <laughs> field trips. So we have one overnight in out-of-state field trip for this month. Uh, it is Nash Central High School. Uh, this is a yearly trip that they take. It's the AP Events Placement Seminar and Research Group from Nash Central High School. Uh, they will be traveling to Philadelphia on Saturday, November the 5th, uh, and returning on Monday, uh, November the 7th. Uh, they have 10 chaperones uh, for 40 students, uh, and this is for approval tonight. Yes, sir. Next, we present to the board. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any questions or discussion? I need a motion for this action. So moved. It's been a proper move on Mr. Lamb, seconded by, was it Mr. Bissett? Questions or discussions? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Ayes have it. With that said, we will adjourn the uh, Channel Academic Service Committee. The next item on the agenda will be the student support. Everything there is informational only, so we can go. Uh, so we can walk through that and go through that one. Hello, Dr. Washington. All right, so uh, Mr. McQueen is up with his. Um, Good evening, board chair. Oh, Okay. All right. Well, good evening, uh, board chair, uh, vice chair, Dr. Washington, Dr. Ellis, and to the members of the board. Uh, I'm here to give you just some information about the uh, accidental warranty purchase for uh, some Chromebooks that we will we purchase using ECF funds. Uh, the technology department has acquired a number of Chromebooks at no cost to the district, and using the ECF funding. Uh, that was awarded to Nash County Public Schools. Uh, this set of Chromebooks actually helped us to make our second uh, year of our refresh plan that was approved by the board. Uh, I think it was June 7, 2021. Uh, so however, utilizing the ECF funds to purchase these Chromebooks, uh, we're not allowed to purchase warranty using uh, this, this funding. So on March 7th, the board did approve for the purchase of the Chromebooks and we received them in March as well. But because the Chromebooks were a part of the second year refresh, we rolled them out at the beginning of the school year, the next school year, which is this school year, 22-23. Uh, and uh, the plan is to add warranty to them within a year. So the financial implications to cover the cost of the warranty is of uh, $389,722.86. So the funding will be paid from the ESSER funding, which is has already been budgeted for the technology refresh plan. And so this uh, item is presented to you. The superintendent is presenting this item as information. Are there any questions for me? Okay, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Board Chair, Madam Vice Board Chair, members of our school board attending in person and those attending virtually. I wanted to stand before you this afternoon just to give you a brief update on the beginning of the year transportation updates.
Okay, so uh, once again, just to touch base on where we are with things right now, currently with our transportation. Um, and Mr. McQueen, if you could go to slides. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, just to catch you up to speed on the opt-in and request for transportation status, currently we have about 7,750 students routed to a bus. These requests are compiled um, of those who opted in for transportation this summer, including our McKinney-Vento students and those needing exceptional children's transportation services. Requests are ongoing and currently being processed at this time, so we're still constantly getting requests on a daily basis, and we're trying to fulfill those requests as we get them. This is an increase. I'm sorry, Mr. This is an increase of 1,950 additional students from the end of last school year. And just looking at the numbers, I think we've come to the conclusion that more students are riding the bus as COVID numbers consistently drops in our district among our students. More parents are becoming more comfortable with putting their students on the bus. At each building level of our district, bus coordinators who are assistant principals will begin cleaning routes and assist in our transportation department. This will assist with overcrowding and arrival times to and from school. A lot of times when we have many students routed to a route, that bus driver is going to hold true to that route. If we have 40 students on that bus, that bus driver is going to stop by all 40 stops to make sure that we get those students. So once we can identify who are true riders versus those who are not riding, we can eliminate those names. And that will also help condense and shorten the bus route itself. An observation of who's utilizing our transportation services will have to remain an ongoing process. Our driver shortage continues to remain a challenge for our district. We have had a total of five drivers. Um, we received their resignation due to accepting other means of employment since August the 26th. That was the Friday before school started on August the 29th. Just most recently, I had one to resign last week who lived in Runner Rapids. It was just too far of a drive for her to come to Nash County um, to work for an hour and 15 minutes. Her commute was almost the same amount of time. These shortages have put a strain on routes within our rural areas, making routes much longer. Many of our substitute drivers are now um, on buses full time or until further notice. So our substitute pool has uh, really been hit hard. Our driver shortage continues. Currently, we are running 115 routes daily, which was 125 towards the beginning of the school year. So that's 115 buses that's on the road daily. With those 115 buses, please keep in mind that some of those buses are driving more multiple routes for different tiers of school. So some are doing high school, elementary, and middle. Some are just doing high school and elementary. Some are doing middle and non-traditional, which is your Tar River, City High, and Early College. We currently have, we currently have the need for eight to 10 drivers with the focus of those drivers driving in rural areas of our county, uh, northern and the southern Nash end of the counties being two of the, the major uh, concerns. <coughs> Next steps going forth. We will increase our efforts in recruitment, um, informing the public of employment opportunities and the need for drivers and mechanics. Um, advertising our driver class uh, training schedule through our social media platform, as well as our local media. I uh, know that I've spoken to Michelle Fiskus probably twice or three times a week, just giving her updates on our bus class and also sharing information with our principals, making sure that they have the opportunity to ask their staff uh, especially their classified staff, if they have anyone that would be interested in taking our next bus class October the 3rd through the 5th. Um, working to improve arrival and dismissal times in our rural areas of the county due to having uh, to collapse routes as an impact of our driver shortage. So uh, just this morning, we had an opportunity to meet with Dr. Ellis to kind of brainstorm some ideas that we've had um, for the southern end of the county, trying to merge some of those elementary routes that's going to get our middle school students to school on time. In closing, we are still facing challenges of uh, shortages related to drivers. We are utilizing everyone to assist with driving who currently holds a CDL with a passenger student endorsement. Do we have any questions? 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's correct. Typically, it's about a month and a half. Um, they will come in at the beginning of the month and take the actual written portion of the class, and then they will have to go on the road with the DMV representative, Mr. Jerry Fields. Uh, not this, not this go round, but what we we've had a lot of coaches come back and get renewals. Yeah, they worked probably bus, they will get additional pay other than the regular salary. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we have about my money about so we have about 12 to 14 training right now. Yes, sir. Which if we can get them trained, get them on routes, that would help us out. Yes, sir. But we were running about 120 buses last year, so we're running 115 this year. I think with Mr. Hopkins, with some more head counting that we're doing, that could reduce it a bit. But the problem is, if you still don't have people in the buses, you could have an issue. Yes, uh, I do think you've got a good plan that we talked about today, where you've got a good chance of only having about one late bus at the southern end before we want, but it will at least bring those kids. In the morning on time, yes, sir. To me, is a big thing because in the afternoon, at least they're finishing the construction. You've got some of that lag time to be in school, but um, I do think it's time. And I talked to Mr. Hopkins about this. We're tracking how many staff members in the county actually have a CDL um, because if we can find out who has the CDLs, we can start asking that we can pay, and then we need to have a conversation about. Um, teacher assistants, custodians, student service like IFS, data students, anyone that's paid through that TA type uh, certified rate would be a chance that we need to start saying you're required to get your CDLs at least to be a sub driver because we could figure this out if we get 12 to 14 driving. But then if someone calls out, at least we would have a sub at the school that could go in and subs get paid. So we got to just make a decision shortly. We need some backups for them. I think Hopkins, you're already using the subs we right are. now. We are. Um, I feel the language. So is that a federal law or state law the age in the person? That is a state law. I'm over sure because I talked to them. We talked about because I've always said for many years that they reduced the age. One year, because now it's always been a problem. With, like I told Mr. Hopkins, especially at the southern end, by the time you have somebody 18 years old go through the training and all that, they graduate or go to college or look for a job. If the state was entertained since everybody's in the same boat, to drop it down to 17 years, I guarantee you, our four high schools to find 10 students per school interested in driving a bus at 17 years old. That would help tremendous every school group. And I don't doubt that, but we have about 150 to 200 right now in our bills that have CDLs and they're not technically driving. So we got to figure out how to get a master list, get a MAP endorsement, and just say, look, can you be on standby? Uh, because if not, we're going to keep nickel and diamond because I don't know how much more we can reroute for what you all have done. Uh, but we got to put something with a little bit of teeth in it saying, at least if you get hired, you got to get your CDLs endorsed. You don't have to have a route, but at least be on standby so we can get you just in case. <laughs> and really, all they would have to do is drive for their school. It, it wouldn't be that big of an issue. So. We got to really, and, and I've got to yeah. key ingredient drive for this school because we've tried that before and we had to send them from here to Yonder and everywhere else. And people got to remember, you know, if you're a teacher so in that middle or so in that high school, they had to drive eight miles to the close elementary school because this is the feature of purpose of having them drive the elementary And if I may say something, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, and I did, I, I actually have not been a supporter of um, requiring teacher assistance to um, 
to have that that license. However, I've had several conversations um this year with teachers assistants um at multiple schools who said that that's something that they would be interested in. I think there's not a lot of push because we have tried to um just from what I know um kind of say okay let's look into the community and and um recruit but I think um understanding the circumstances and actually had I had those conversations with, with TAs like okay what do you think about this because I was not a supporter before um but I think it is something that um we should look into and I think that we have um with a better understanding of how that would actually work in terms of uh teacher recruitment but also not having to have a route and not having to, for every teacher assistant to to have to have a route. Um, I think with better understanding, I would definitely be in support of that. And I know that in the teachers, several teachers that I spoke to would also be interested um, if there was a way to work it out where they wouldn't come with their classes. But again, now that we have the um, staggered start and end time, I think that would be, a, a better, a much better idea this year and moving forward. Thank you. Um, thank everyone for their comments. Um, unfortunately, this meeting does not have a form to move forward, um, but I think all things happen for a reason. We'll have more time to discuss this, Madam Clerk. Please put it on in the next month for us to bring it back um, next month and get, and get um, the feedback that we need from the additional community uh, members, excuse me, uh, but with the criticalness of transportation um, and for our respect for the um, time of uh, Mr. Hopkins and Mr. Howard, I do want to at least allow them to report out. So Mr. Howard, if you want to come forward. Yes, sir. So there's nothing to actually bring back of these are the information only. Just sharing the information. So what are we asking Transportation to do because he shared the information, right? So, right. so the, all of your items are just for information, no action is required. Right, but we can't add it to the record without. The, uh -uh. You can bring it to the, yeah, you can bring it to the board. The information, just bring the information to the board. There's no action required, so you can bring that to the board. Correct me wrong, the board. You can add it. Yeah, you don't need to the record. Yeah. But we cannot take action. But we cannot take action. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Howard. Good evening, board chair, Madam Vice Chair, board members, and Dr. Ellis. Um, take some time. I'm also excited, as Mr. Thompson was earlier, uh, to present information on the mail, the village mails to men mentoring update. Uh, this evening, I'll provide you with a deeper insight of where we are, our status, uh, a few updates, who, who we've met with, meetings that I'm looking forward to having. The Village Males to Men Mentoring has provided orientations uh, to principals, assistant principals, and school counselors. Uh, we've had mandatory meetings with deans of students and student support specialists, and also their designees at the school. A few of my most exciting meetings that I've had have been with uh, Chief Corey Mercer of Rocky Mount Fire Department, where we had the opportunity to not just have a meeting, but also lead with three mentors. Uh, Chief Hassel and his team, uh, they're still working to carve out uh, how they'll be working with the village, but I'm excited about that piece as well. Uh, one of the uh, highlights from my meeting with Chief Hassel is that uh, through his time here, he's had uh, the opportunity to work with uh, quite a few organizations, quite a few uh, programs, but he's really excited about where we're headed with the Village One. It's in-house. It's, it's, uh, it comes from out of the school district, and we wanted to compliment um, Dr. Ellis for um, taking that leap of faith. And so um, he's excited that he doesn't have to spend $100,000 uh, to bring board uh, one of the existing uh, programs and nonprofits in the, in the state, so within the district. So he's excited as well as his team. Uh, just today, we pushed out a s'more uh, to his team, and I think 137 folk responded. Uh, last leave on the office was 218. We'll talk a little bit more about marketing and, and some of our strategies in terms of communication, but it's like, whoa. 
okay, are we going to have enough space in here to hold um, some of the people that are excited or want to hear more about the mentor interest meeting? I'll speak more about that. Uh, wonderful meeting with Pastor Matt Baker at First Presbyterian Church. And uh, uh, one of my highlight meetings with, uh, with uh, Rocky Mount Housing Authority with uh, Mr. Kevin Macklin and Jerry Harper, where uh, they had some great suggestions. And I'm excited to hear about um, how they'll work to support us. They actually want us to come back and speak to 15 of their custodians, where he's possibly going to find a way to recoup them for that 45 minutes to an hour of participation from the school. So we're excited about that. Not sure if you had an opportunity to see um, the WIG TV morning show. Um, it's provided on as a resource, important document to the end of this PowerPoint. That was a great opportunity to share with the community about where um, the village is headed, but also um, they invited us back in January. But I asked, well, well, if we could come back in January, how about coming back in May and allow our mentees to um, put on a showcase for where the exciting things that are going to happen during the second semester. Upcoming meetings, um, Friday, uh, October 7th, and also Friday, October 21st. I'm looking forward to hosting here um, two sessions each Friday for uh, folk that are interested or would be interested in being a mentor um, within these five schools. Uh, we'll also be having additional faith-based organization meetings. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thompson, for getting me in, in contact with uh, Cummins, Edwards Incorporated, Nash Community College, C.W. Will Williams, Pfizer, United Health, and Nash County Sheriff and Fire Department. We're looking forward to having some, some dialogue with them so we can see how they can fit in um, some mentors from where we're headed. So I anticipate those meetings. Uh, you see OIC SOAR Program Manager, uh, Shanithia Hansen. Uh, we met last Thursday. That was a very productive meeting. Uh, looking to see how she can partner with us with her SOAR program, providing employment skills and um, social skills training and possibly um, just soft skills for our young men as we continue to move forward with that uh, next steps. So uh, just a quick review, I won't be long. Uh, we're looking to uh, recruit and attract uh, 12 candidates, 12 to 15 uh, young men that are prone to economic, medical, employment, educational and legal inequalities. Uh, these 12 to 15 at-risk males are first time freshmen. They would have shown leadership and academic capacity. Students who show interest in a career, military, trade, or collegiate opportunities. The village will not serve as a dumping ground for students with high maintenance behaviors. Principals, counselors, deans of students, and student support specialists are at this time screening and selecting um, 12 to 15 mentees. A little bit, just want to go back about what the matching process or what the mentor will be expected to do. They will work with one to three students, 45 minutes to one hour per week, set days and times we want to speak about that shortly. And mentors must complete the district background screening and be approved before interacting with our students. Mentor and mentee meetings will be supervised at all times by the deans of students and the student support specialists. I have two here, but the deadline was actually Friday the 23rd for all high schools to have their, uh, their schedules in. So right now we have Tar River Academy. Their schedule is Wednesdays at one o'clock in the guidance office. That's where their mentor session will take place. NAS Central High School, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, 11 a.m., 12 p.m., and 1 p.m., they will host in the media center. Rocky Mount High School schedule, they will host Wednesdays, 11 a.m., in the media center. Northern Nash, 
will host Monday and Friday, 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., uh, various locations throughout their, bu their building. And um, um, Dr. Ellis, Mr. Hugh Scott had a, you know, he said, Mr. Howard, we have 12 males in our school right now. We have mentors ready to go right now. So um, they have mentoring that's going to occur in their building um, multiple times during the week uh, throughout various locations. <clears throat> so uh, this is something I've been excited about. Uh, prior to her getting here uh, physically, we were going back and forth, uh, working with Mrs. Uh, Fiscus, and I hope I didn't run her off, but we've had some <laughs> great conversation. Um, I just, when she did speak um, to our principals meeting, said, man, I hope I haven't kind of went overboard on some things. So um, I, as soon as she got in, we kind of sat and talked. I said, Mrs. Fiscus, just point me in the right direction and help me do what I can. Um, Legally, legally, ethically, and morally, to make sure we're on the same page. So um, she was excited about what she had an opportunity to share with the, um, the group. And I just wanted to take that and mirror that and make sure that we're in alignment with um, what she's bringing to the district. So uh, we're in process of creating a, a landing page for the village. And I've already submitted my homework for that. So that September 30th date may change. And then we're working on a social media ad um, that was due October 3rd, but I turned that in Friday because I asked some questions about that October 4th and 5th date to promote our mentor interest meeting that's scheduled for October 7th. So we can move up and be able to promote that, that campaign uh, you know, more days before um, October 7th. So we have... Uh, also, she wanted to run a, an infographic with highlights about the program that links back to the landing page. So uh, please forgive me. A lot of these terms that she's explaining to me, I'm, I'm catching up with her. I'm catching up with her, but um, I truly appreciate her support. And then see the last one here says send content for uh, social media ad three. That's what that is, ad three uh, to Ms. Fiscus. Uh, by October 14th, because we will have uh, that Friday, on October 21st, the mentor interest meeting here. Uh, and that will be two sessions. Uh, I'm going to back up for a second. One of the things when I, I met with uh, Chief Mercer and Chief Hassel, uh, Mr. Baker, well, Mr. Howard, what time do you want him to be there? Well, what time do you want the mentors there? Mm. Okay, next time we meet, we'll have that. So I uh, went back, I met with the principals and their designees, and I said, listen, we got, a, we got something we need to tweak. I have folk that I'm sitting down with, they're asking me what time do these people need to report. I don't have any information. I know it's somewhat premature to be thinking about January through May, but we need to have these mentors. They're on fire to come out, but I have no times. So those times that I shared with you, the principals submitted those by Friday, and we have times now to share out with the community on when they come into the schools. So here we go. Whoever 15 scholars that meet that criteria, uh, they need to have that selection uh, by October 3rd. But they need to have a verbal, some verbal uh, feedback from the parents by October 10th. So from uh, August 15th, to October 10th, uh, communities and schools has been working with us also to locate 20 to 25 mentors. That's about four to five mentors per school. Dr. Ellis, I'm looking to exceed that number. I know I um, it would be nice if we didn't have to, you know, have mentors trying to stretch out one to three. It'd be a beautiful thing that could be one on one. So that's that's what I'm, I'm looking for. October 11th to December 1st, each high school will host a formal rollout for parents and mentees to review the expectations and activities set for the school year. At this meeting, each mentee will be paired with their mentor. Parents will have the opportunity to meet the mentors, 
that have been paired. Parents will be required to be in attendance at this meeting because this is when they will sign the application and review a lot of the materials. And here are next steps for next semester. So remember those who made a lasting impression in your life, now it's our turn. It's our turn and that's what we do here on a daily basis. But I'm asking if you have any, anyone that you feel may be interested, please send them my way. Get in contact with them and let them know more about where we're headed. Questions, suggestions? No, at this time, I think you're heading in a good um, direction. You pretty much take the course with the initial timeline that you provided us. Yes, and I think it will um, be great after. Yeah, Mr. Howard, in your um, naming of corporate partners that you're working with, yes, sir. I think it was three to five that you listed. But I did not hear the name of Honeywell, which is the leading aerospace industry in the, in the area, uh, as well as C, uh, CSX, which is the open up an um, outlet for bringing in corporate in that area about a year or so ago. Yes, sir. Um, so the other thing is, with that said, the reason I'm sort of strong with the corporate levels, because if you get corporate levels into mentoring, you can also, that's a segue we're getting our kids into internships into those corporations and some jobs. Win win. Yes, sir. So, thank you. Thank you. Looks good with those. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. And that back page. If you go back, there's a page there if you want to look at some of the product and resources that we've shared with the principals. So, on that page. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So that closes the information for the student support services. Again, I just want to say, Dr. Ellis, great job. Thank what you're doing and um, how you're working that process. Thank you, Mr. Howard, this is great challenge to segue for our young folks and getting people, our community engaged in what we do. And yes. we just want to say thank you for all the lot of things. I know everybody did a phenomenal job in their presentations. So with that said, if there's nothing else to hold these committees, Mr. Lane. I know. Since everybody got a lot of them. Yeah, I like to talk to other people say, okay, let me clarify that. It's not ROTC. Is junior ROTC. And uh, so just make sure the way it spells out, ROTC is for its college level, junior ROTC is for high school. Thank you. Absolutely. Presently, we've had, I think it's that Northern and Southern, those uh, ROTC instructors who retire. And Chad, I don't want to speak out of turn, I know you've had some involvement with it, but we have had a tough time getting anyone to apply for these positions. Normally there's a regional director where you find candidates where they send us information and that just hasn't been, um, that hasn't happened. And we haven't been able to, to uh, get anyone to apply to see. I know in the summer when I was speaking with Mr. Scott, he had no one. So Chad, and I think we're deciding what do we do because those are open positions, y'all. And if we can't fill them, we got to put, we either got to change our direction of where we go if we can't find because I know when I had an ROTC, an ROTC program when I was high school principal, I never went and hired anyone. They gave us candidates to interview. And I think, Chad, if that's right, that might be the issue. So go ahead. I'm asking, the reason I'm going to let up, I'm having a parent like at the end of Thursday or Friday, say something about the ROTC program. I don't remember how it's wrong. All they are all wrong. It is. Uh, so first of all, I would like to say for the record, we definitely want the JROTC programs because they do so much. The problem that we have ran into is before, you know, you have to work with the headquarters of the actual military. And what we've run into, there's not a there's no one out there at this point that can be hired in the Air Force piece. We've been searching since last, honestly, uh, last spring. Um, 
And so we're continuing this search. Uh, just to be quite honest, we've even looked in, uh, we've called the Army to talk about maybe doing an Army JRTC to switch out if that's the case. Uh, Army right now, from the last that we heard, they're not interested in doing the one because we usually pay one instructor and they'll pay for one instructor. At this point, they're not interested in that, but we're going to continue to talk to them about that. Uh, but we feel like it's very strong to have at the schools, and it's going to be something that we're constantly pushing for. I think a lot of people yeah. somebody has to circle back to Yes, sir. It's not. Uh, and and honestly, if we had someone out there, we would hire them today if it was someone strong. So. Thank you. Well, let me just talk to that people back here. Talk to that. Right now, uh, Mr. Thompson, there's no regional director for the Air Force. The regional director is normally in a three to four area, three to four states. Sir. There's no one in that position. The local, the person that handled is the sectional director who's out of Alabama. So he's sort of recruiting, he's sort of covering all that. So before they can place people in junior IJROTC, that's the direct, that's the role of the regional director, which they don't have anybody supplying there. And the reason they don't have anybody supplying that need is because there's a lot of travel requirements because you go up down about four or five states. And so they don't have by military that it was very valuable for our schools to absolutely and for it to be jerked out from under them with no real explanation and all that. It's uncalled for. I don't care who's falling. But again, Mr. Lamb, that's not a school system. I know you know what I, I mean? I know so that that's name. that fall that falls within the jurisdiction of the military itself. They don't have the staffing to do that. But how can they come, how can they expect to come in our high school and recruit? We can't even supply what we need, man. But so let me, let me just clarify that too. When they when they join ROTC, I think you don't a junior ROTC, they don't necessarily go into the military branches. They just do that section. And if you look at the data that shows that, you got a small amount of folks that are in junior hour. While it's a great program, great program, you got a small amount of people that's coming out of junior ROTC that's actually going into the military. What you find mostly, what most impacts coming when you get the ROTC side, that's at the college level. Now they do have because those are all officers going in for an officer position. Whereas the junior ROTC, that's pretty much for him. This would be JV team before we have a new bar. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and with that said, here, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs>